Welcome back. And we are now um, going to move into the panel presentation, giving a case study of designing and implementing MOVEN, a systems engineering approach to addressing context in a complex intervention. And our two panelists are Dr. Barbara King, who's associate professor in the School of Nursing, um, and Dr. Lindsay Stege, associate professor also in the School of Nursing. Um, and this again represents a um, collabor collaboration between uh, nursing and systems engineering. So we'll have the panel presentation followed by a uh, discussion and uh, question and answer. So um, Barb and Lindsay, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you. Lindsay, you're gonna share our slides. Thank you. All right, so um, I do wanna add here that yesterday, um, Andrew and Brian had on their badger hat. So today I wore my badger scarf. So we adequately, so we represent uh, the university. So we'll be talking uh, rather quickly about how we um, engage in designing and implementing MOVEN um, within uh, two different clinical sites. So uh, next slide, Lindsay. <laughs> there you go. All right, so uh, anyone who knows that how I talk about um, ambulation knows that I could spend an hour alone on this topic, uh, but briefly to um, provide some context, Older adults often walk in, come into a hospital admitted, completely independent in their abilities to perform basic activities of daily living and ambulate. And um, for a more than for a, up to what 60% of those, they're going to be discharged from the hand from the hospital with a newly diagnosed uh, disability in an ADL or inability to walk um, across a small room. So we know that limited patient ambulation and bed rest are the most predictable and preventable cause of loss of function or loss of ambulation. And there's new data that would indicate that these percentages of how limited people actually um, walk or get out of bed is now up to 100% of the time. So when individuals lose their ability to ambulate, we, you know, obviously there's gonna be multiple negative consequences for this. So we definitely see higher mortality rates, falls that are occurring both during and after discharge. Obviously patients aren't happy when they no longer um, can function independently. So we see high patient dissatisfaction, increased caregiver burden, 22% um, increase in nursing home placement. They actually have to stay longer in hospitals and we do see a, a significant increase in readmission rates. Now, we also know that um, traditionally nurses have been responsible for maintaining patient functional independence, uh, but we also have identified or documented that nurses infrequently ambulate patients. When we've done the research and looking at what are the issues with limited patient ambulation to understand what are the barriers, nursing staff identify multiple personal and organizational barriers that prevent them from simply getting a patient up to walk. Next slide. So how did we address this? Um, this has been an ongoing process for Lindsay and I probably for the last four or five years. We really looked at how do we um, get at this issue of improving uh, patient ambulation. So we engaged in the five-step process for a systematic intervention design. We had already engaged in step one and two um, in some of the um, research that I had done in the past, looking at where, where's the gap of practice, um, what would tell us what other existing interventions we're doing, how, how could we address our model of care that filled in the, the holes of other interventions that were not being met. So for the studies that we did, we started at step three, four, and five. So we definitely knew what the barriers were for patient um, nurse and assisted patient ambulation. But we, then we had to figure out, well, how do we address these barriers systematically? So Lindsay's gonna talk about this a little bit more in detail, but we found, we looked at that systems engineering initiative, patient safety model. We mapped the barriers that we knew that nurses were addressing. 
um, on top of this model, but then we also had to think about, well, then how do we do behavior change um, to, uh, uh, but at both a nurse level and a unit level. So we had to bring in two different integrated models. And then we thought, well, okay, now we had to test this um, intervention that we have to see if it's effective. And we ran it at one hospital and found, yep, we actually could um, create a, use an intervention that had five moving parts at the same time. But then we wanted to think about, well, but then can a clinical team take this intervention? And what happens when they um, do the implementation rather than us? So uh, we also, and this engaged with having a participatory design with our second site to see how effective this was. And we really wanted to evaluate the effectiveness at both patient level, um, organizational level, and a unit level looking at, um, at patient outcomes. So next slide. You're on, Lindsay. OK, so as Barb said, we had identified from her work and also from the literature that there were a number of barriers um, to nurse-initiated patient ambulation. And what we also saw that was there were also interventions to address this issue, but many of them only focused on one or a couple of the barriers. And being a systems engineer, I, I and Barb agreed, felt pretty strongly that we really needed to get all of these barriers, try to remove them, get them out of the way of the nursing staff um, so that then we could facilitate that desired um, nurse initiated patient ambulation process. So we used, as Barb said on the previous slide, the Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety or SEEPS model. And particularly, we were looking at the structure of the work system. And what we identified was that the barriers that we, we identified in literature could re really mapped nicely to the components of a work system. So for example, there was a known barrier that nurses often lack self-efficacy or confidence in their skills and their abilities to get um, patients up and walking, particularly patients who may be higher risk for falls, and that fits within the person element or component of a work system. There were also barriers related to insufficient resources, both personnel and equipment, so that the tools that people need really to carry out ambulation. There were um, organization barriers, particularly around culture, um, where there was a lack of nurse ownership or a identity as, as owning this task, and also a very strong fear of fall um, or avoidance of falls culture within nursing and within the hospital organization that really um, was getting in the way of a positive ambulation or progression of mobility culture. There also was really not a lack, a lot of specificity or clarity around communication around ambulation. This, this task was, was really missing and not, um, there weren't cues or support within the system for nurses to communicate effectively with other members of the team about ambulation and with patients as well. And then lastly, um, in many cases, the physical environment itself, the built environment uh, also acted as a barrier to ambulation. So there was this really nice alignment with looking at this from a whole systems perspective. And this helped us to really think about where we needed to try to intervene with our multi-component intervention. If we wanted to tackle all of this, we really needed to hit at all of the pieces of the work system structure in designing our intervention. And so that's what we did. We came up with these five components that really overlay on top of the structure of the work system. Um, where this is, these are the pieces of move-in that we started to build. So we add resources, we have specific communication tasks and tools and structures that we're providing. We have a, a enhancement to the ambulation environment, um, work on unit culture and how we're trying to change that. And then a psychomotor skills training that really gets at that nurse piece at the center of the model. And so the SEEPS model was really helpful in um, thinking of the system, seeing this connection between all the barriers that we needed to address. Um, but as Barb alluded to, we also have ultimately a behavior change. So we removed the barriers and then we're now needing to figure out how to facilitate the individual nurses and also the groups of nurses, the culture um, towards ambulation. So we recognized that while we kind of knew where we needed to address, um, in some cases, we didn't have a great theoretical basis for how um, we should work on this human behavior change. So that's where we integrated SEEPS plus social cognitive theory um, as our behavior change theory. And we really specifically used social cognitive theory in how we designed 
um, the details within the unit culture component of move-in, the psychomotor skills training, and the communication. So really those pieces that have the strongest um, human behavior change um, element to them. So then putting this all together, using SEEPs and social cognitive theory as our theoretical foundations, we designed MoveIn as this five component systems level implemented at a unit level within a hospital intervention. All of those pieces work together to remove barriers and facilitate increased patient ambulation. And then ultimately towards those outcomes that Barb highlighted on the first slide, working to improve patient health, um, some improved outcomes for the healthcare organization, and then also an improved staff experience. So building on that theoretical framework, Barb's now gonna talk a little bit more about what happened when we, um, when we think about implementing this. Okay, so um, one of the things when we've talked about DNI research with movement in the past, and helping people understand um, what MoveIn is, um, we actually built in implementation strategies into the MoveIn design. And part of that is because we used a human factors approach to actually do the design and behavior change. So we wanted to think about, well then how do we take a hospital soil um, and then can we modify movement to fit within a different organization based upon that organization's needs? So part of what we did with the study is creating better seats. So how do we tweak a little bit of the five components of movement to fit within their context? So um, what I'll tell you in the next slides are how we thought about these implementation strategies that were built into the five components. The other piece of what we had to do with our site that we were testing at is to think about how does it, how do we work with that organization to then um, create move-in specifically for them. So part of this was thinking about tailoring and adapting components to fit a specific unit, um, which I'll chat about. We need to think about how do we train and educate our stakeholders, which actually they were the, going to be the ones that were going to launch move-in with us taking a more of a guide um, approach with them. Uh, this is gonna be a nurse initiated intervention. So we had to think a lot about how do we support the nurses as they um, launch this intervention and what additional education or training might they need. Um, we had to think about communication and feedback loops within that organization and what was gonna be really effective. And then part of a lot of what Lindsay and I struggled with is how much coaching support is this organization going to need to actually pull off launching this intervention with us more standing back and watching what was gonna happen. Next slide. So this is where our better seeds start to come in and that's the fit piece of it. As Lindsay indicated, these are our five components, the psychomotor skills training, the built-in strategies that we already thought about was educating and training different stakeholders, both physical therapists and nursing staff are gonna be engaged in this psychomotor training. We had to think about how do we bring, what is that interrelationship between PT and nursing and how do they work together? And then we had to think, well, how do we adapt and tailor this to the context of the organization? How much lead time do they need to get nurses scheduled to, to engage in this psychomotor? Um, skills training? Is it nurses across all shifts? Is it one shift versus the other? And so we were working with them on what makes better sense within their organization. Um, we had to think about resources within the organization and thinking about what financial strategies could we utilize to best support um, the site. And part of that was hiring an additional um, ambulation aid who is part of the staff on the unit, not just somebody who pops in, says, I'll walk a patient, pops out. And what would that require within this organization to um, guarantee that FTE? We had to think a lot about these communication strategies. Here we used a very iterative and evaluation um, component. And as far as like whiteboards are part of our communication strategy. Well, these are the components that need to be on the whiteboard. What's the layout that works the best for that organization? Is there something different that we need to add in to this whiteboard that doesn't change the messaging, but makes sense for them and how they use it? Where does the whiteboard need to be located within their patient rooms that has a better fit within that context? 
Um, and then we also did updated communication flyers, which we sent out every week to really let the nursing staff know all of the wonderful successes they were having within the organization, but we needed to think about the format of the flyer within the organization and what makes made more sense for them. Next slide. And then we had to think about our ambulation environment. So this in this for influence patient strategy, we had to think about what's the infrastructure? How do we support clinicians? How do we adapt and tailor the content? So we had to work a lot with um, environmental services at our second site to find out what were our availability for installing distant markers? Um, what were our options? What did the staff want to see? Where should they be placed? Is there a color variation? What makes most sense to them? And that was part of that in uh, participatory design where they were helping us co-create what this would look like for them. And our biggest issue we dealt a lot with was unit culture. Because if we had changed everything else and weren't able to get a change in culture, we would not be as successful. This became a really big primary component. And so again, we had to think about financial strategies. How do we support? How do we adopt and tailor? So we use small incentives to provide to staff to you know, get patients up and walking. So they did gift card drawings every week uh, for people that walked their patients. We also built in larger incentives to help them celebrate their goals when they had met an ambulation goals. We thought about positive messaging and feedback to the staff about all the wonderful things they were doing. So we built communication boards and what that looked like, that would look like for them, um, how they wanted to set up their communication board to look at goals uh, that they were meeting. And then specific incentives for each unit. So do they want pizza parties? Do they want ice cream parties? Do they want you know, a big celebration event to occur? And what should that look like for them? And then how to help them organize that um, uh, for their unit. So next slide. So this is where we brought in the replicating um, effective uh, programs framework. And um, as we have listed down here. So we thought about preconditions. We needed to design a toolkit, an implementation manual that was tailored for the site and made sense for them. So here we use a community hospital advisory team, which we called the chat, and they reviewed components of our manual, gave us a lot of feedback. We spent a lot of time on the timeline with them, like what needed to happen three months before, what needed to happen two weeks before, and so on and so forth. Um, we needed to form our launch team and make sure that they were adequately trained. So who was gonna be the champions on the unit? What were their roles and responsibilities? How did that fit within their context? And then we launched the implementation. And here we shifted to another model. So now we started using REAIM. We wanted to understand what was our reach, how many nurses would be trained, um, how many volunteers. We had to think about efficacy. And here we wanted to understand what was this impact on these outcomes at a patient level, at a unit level. And also, what was or were they ad, um, adhering to fidelity of how they launched this intervention? Um, we also wanted to think about adoption. We did that later as we talked to um, our nurse leaders to think about value statement and what they needed to think see in order to adopt more um, system wide um, implementation. Got us into again our whole fidelity checks, and now and then we thought about maintenance. So. Does this stick? Does this work? And how long um, does this actually stick? In next slide. So Lindsay is going to jump on on this one, and this is kind of our lessons learned from this. Yeah. So just to wrap up and then get into the discussion. Um, so basically, the the key takeaways that I think we would want to have from our our process was that. We, we didn't, we used a systems engineering and a human factors for participatory design approach from the very beginning when we were designing our intervention. So we, we didn't um, sort of build something and then try to think about how to implement. We were already 
trying to change the system from the beginning. So a lot of our implementation or the, the context adaptations are sort of written in or uh, embedded within the move-in design and, and the actual intervention itself. And then certainly there are additional tailoring and things that happen um, within each site as well. Um, but, but what we learned was that even with having all that and having that already sort of built in or intentionally designed from the get-go and put into our toolkit, um, that that still may not be enough um, for successful implementation. Um, what we saw was that organizations may not be ready for this type of complexity. Like we, we tried to really think about everything and all the moving pieces and they may need some help with navigating that even with a toolkit. So trying to determine readiness both for, for the intervention, the idea of focusing on mobility itself, but also are they ready to do this sort of staff driven, staff engaged, it's really nurse owned, this is supposed to come like from the front line um, and then managing uh, an intervention that has these different system pieces where you're making changes potentially at, at multiple levels. Um, so figuring out how do we assess that? How can we know that upfront? And how can we then potentially maybe offer different types of on top of our baked in implementation strategies that exist within movement itself, how can we add supplements to that to where organizations may require additional coaching or different strategies for how they're evaluating and, and iterating through this complex uh, implementation process. And that's kind of where we're sitting right now with some of the questions that we're trying to address with um, with moving. And with that, I think we're done with our um, presentation. This is just our reminder contact and we can, I guess I can stop sharing and turn it back over to the panel. That is just outstanding. Um, it really exemplified a lot of what we've been talking about in the last couple of days and, and pulled it all together. Um, I'm impressed at, at the holistic approach that you use to uh, develop to figuring out the implementation strategies. And it reminds us how those strategies, um, you can't necessarily rely on just one thing. I, I also really like the approach to building it in, baking it into the intervention. So I am going to now turn to ask Byron and Laura if you have any questions for Barb and Lindsay. Uh, my my first thing was that I was wanting to applaud throughout your entire presentation. I thought that was really, really beautiful and a, a, a beautiful example of, you know, we've talked a little bit of, in this short course about like combining frameworks and and uh, also justifying the use of, of frameworks. And uh, this was just a beautiful example of that. So uh, bravo, mostly I just want to be friends with you all. So hopefully uh, uh, that can happen someday in person. Um, I'm curious on the culture, uh, and and sorry if I missed this, but I love that you identified that as an important thing to change. I'm wondering how, how successful were you in doing that, and um, what ideas do you have, uh, you know, in terms of of successfully um, changing culture, or if if there are things that you learned about, uh, you know, things that didn't work, but things that you would do differently if you had to do it again. Lindsay, you can jump in too. Uh, um, yeah, like we learned. Barbara. We learned so much about culture. Um, we actually measured um, barriers to patient ambulation and we modified the AHRQ patient safety um, uh, tool to indicate ambulation culture. And we did see a statistically significant improvement in how they thought about barriers and culture change. Um, but we also did a lot looking at frequency and distance that patients were ambulated and look at who, where the uptake was. Was it just nurse RNs? Was it CNAs? Did it, did it have to do with all of them? And we didn't have time to present that data, but it's quite impressive when you see these incredibly steep jumps in how often patients were walking and how far patients were walking. And most importantly is the stick. So in the first unit we did this on, it, it sustained for four years before they disbanded the unit. <laughs> And, and then we lost everybody. The second unit we tested on, it was sticking. Even after we stopped giving them ice cream and cake and incentives, it still stuck. And then COVID happened. So, so when COVID happened, we actually saw that the distances were dropping, but they were still trying to hold on to the frequency that they were trying to get patients out. 
Now I'm sure that it's really tanked at this point because of what our hospitals look like. We didn't anticipate a pandemic <laughs> to look at what would happen. But clearly there was a change in what was happening at that unit level with behaviors. Um, on, we did qualitative studies, a lot of qualitative interviews. And I will tell you from the first site that we ran this at, what we were hearing from the nursing staff is that shifted ownership. They now said, this is my job. I have to get patients moving because if I don't, they're gonna get worse. So I have I to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. They also felt incredible buy-in by um, their nurse leaders because they, would, they actually agreed to give them an FTE nursing assistant to help. So they saw that as incredibly important. Also, we had nurse leaders attending these big celebrations and just physically having them show up said to them, this is important because they, it's important to them, they're paying attention. Um, we did big push-outs in the second unit. Um, we did actually both sites did nursing grand rounds. So then we actually, Lindsay and I didn't present. We said, you present this, it's yours. And it was wonderful to watch what was happening. Um, there was a lot of anecdotal, also culture change components that we didn't know anything about. And they were starting to tell us and we're like, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we didn't know that was really going on um, to watch what was happening at the unit level with how they, they owned it. They said, this is us, it's better for our patients. We want to improve this and the shift just happened. So I would just add, and I am a systems engineer, so I'm a little biased here, but I think Barb alluded to this, but I think one of the key successes we had is, I don't, I don't think we're experts in culture change. And, and we threw a bunch of things at this, like all the, you know, sort of incentives, feedback loops, um, you know, all the things you can try to use, we kind of threw in here. But to me, what I think really helped is that it was a systems model. So we weren't saying, okay, on top of this, we want to change your culture or after the fact, or, oh yeah, culture change, that's a thing. We should worry about that. It was built in and it was coupled with, as Barb said, they got additional resources. There was investment from leadership. The culture change wasn't just on this unit. Um, you know, we did some front end work with leaders um, and, and it, was, it was this recognition that we weren't just coming in as we often do saying, we need you to make this change. Come on, why won't the culture change? It was, we've tried to rebuild your system here to help you now come along with us. We're, we're getting stuff out of your way. And so I, I think that that systems approach, and we, we were very transparent about this is the thinking behind this, this is why we're doing it this way. And I think that um, that also really, really helped people to buy in and to, to come along with us, the, the staff, and then run from there. So I have a question. Um, we've gotten questions over the last couple of days about, you know, what is the clinical intervention versus what is the implementation strategy? And your work is actually a beautiful example of, um, first of all, I just, you know, does that question really matter? It's, you know, it just is so esoteric maybe at a certain level. But um, you know, you could conceptualize uh, that falls prevention is the evidence-based you know practice that you're trying to implement in order to prevent you know either primary or secondary prevention of downstream you know conditions and uh, impact. Um, or you could say move in is the intervention, and then you have you know strategies that are being used to get move in in place. But the fact that you've um, You've got, you've had such a fluid process of engaging people. You use the words uh, co-design several times, uh, participatory design, human factors, that systems engineering approach that you're talking about, Lindsay, where you have the kind of the holistic work system. Um, that is a concept I think that, you know, when you're bringing uh, people in that they recognize that this is their work system and what they need. Um, so it all just sounds very fluid to me. And I'm wondering if you could reflect on, you know, what is the thing using Jeff Curran's term, you know, fancy terminology, what is the thing that you're implementing and what are the strategies? Or do you just see this as all kind of one 
integrated uh, package. Barb, can I jump first? Yeah, go ahead. Before I lose my You're anxious, jump in. I, well, I feel like I might, uh, it's, yeah. it, there's so much. Um, I, I think that's a fantastic question. And this is one that um, I know Barb and I, and, and me, me especially, we've um, been challenged with as we've moved forward. And as we go to this DNI workshop every year, or as we go to um, DNI meetings or get into the literature, I'm like, well, we don't seem to quite fit. Um, you know, maybe it's a language issue. And so a lot of times I'm a pragmatist. I'm like, it's language. We can squint. We fit. Um, but when we try to say, this is our intervention and these are the this is the implementation or this is the thing, I, I would agree. I don't think that for us, it really separates. And I think we haven't we didn't, we've never worried about that until we try to come and speak to others <laughs> and put it, in a, put it in a language where we can, other people can connect it to their mental model or their framework. Um, we have said um, we're using, we believe good systems design, good human factors. And, and obviously Barb has the clinical expertise um, for, the, for the clinical implementation or the, the clinical intervention. Um, but I think for us, really this is standard nursing practice it's it's not a new thing we're not i mean getting patients up and walking is is care that is supposed to be provided but it it's missed care in in most cases and so really i mean maybe it is that we're just figuring out how to package system redesign um, to better support healthcare professionals in getting their work done for the good of the patient. Um, and that's why we've talked about, could, this, could the process that we followed be used for other, um, other types of missed care or other areas of quality where it's not necessarily that we're implementing some new crazy rocket science clinical innovation. Um, it's getting back to the fundamentals of looking at the system. But I'll let Barb build on that. So my short answer is, it's a great question. I don't know that we have a thing and an implementation. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's blurry for us. I think, I think it is blurry. And part of that blurriness is we have a clinician and engineer creating something. And so we're, we are coming from our point of reference on how we think about things. Um, you know, one of Lindsay's uh, former students who's graduated, um, has did a really interesting study looking at how nurses implement evidence-based practice. And what they don't wanna be happen is being told, here's what you're gonna do with no explanation for why you're doing it and no resources for how to actually engage in that. I think we thought about that a lot in designing movement and that's where the implementation piece of it comes in. You know, nurses don't want to just be told, get your patients walking. They know they should be walking patients. <laughs> they have no time. There's too many barriers. How do I get over these barriers? So working with the sites to say, these are core components for how we need to address this issue. Um, how, do we, how do we match that? How do we use your soil to, you know, make sure that those components fit in your environment? Um, and then massage it a little bit, but still attending to these core components to see what happens. And this is our second time we've launched it and it happened. <laughs> it happened quite well. Um, but we learned so many lessons from that, like the coaching piece of this. We wanted to see what they would do. And we found that they struggled a bit. They, they hadn't had experiences with having money that they could actually purchase food. <laughs> they didn't understand like something as simple as, I would finally say, it's time for a pizza party. Let's do a pizza party. Let me order your pizzas. Cause they were coming up with the strategy for let's get, let's celebrate. You're doing so much work. Cause they were working, working, working so hard. But it was so strange for them to think, oh, we can do this. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> you can do that. And here's how we're gonna help you. So those were a piece of it that, you know, we had, we, we sat back and sat on our hands for the longest time and find like, okay, okay, we just got to jump in and help them celebrate because they're not used to those celebrations. And those celebrations were key for more stimulation and that feedback that they were making incredible progress in what they were doing. So, I mean, we learned a lot thinking about, well, how much coaching? And I think that's what we're stuck with now when we think about implementation. 
how much coaching do sites need when they try to do this type of an intervention? And how does readiness map onto coaching, map, to, map onto strategies you might use to determine readiness? And, you know, we're hoping you're gonna give us this insight. <laughs> what do we do next? I was going to say is um, next ask you if you have questions for Byron and Laura. <laughs> And I, I'm wondering if you'd like to tee that up as a question for Byron and Laura. How do you understand uh, the need for coaching and some, how can you prognosticate ahead of time about that? Yeah, great questions. Can you help us <laughs> figure that out? Well, the topic of readiness assessment came up earlier and I wanna kind of link that to, um, you showed the rep model on one of your slides that that was you know, kind of a high level structure that you used. And uh, when you look at the box called precondition, mm -hmm. that in a way is a form of readiness or at least helping to increase or improve readiness. But what really hit me when I saw that box again um, is that the preconditions are very much from the point of view of what do we as implementation researchers need to do in preparation for you know, implementation and things like, you know, context assessment. I can't remember exactly the things that were in that box, but they were pretty high level and abstract and speaking to us as the audience, I think. But what I'm finding in my work and, and what I'm hearing in your very practical uh, user-centered approach that you're using is that preconditions are things like, were they able to hire that extra FTE do they have a volunteer or what is their process for getting volunteers trained and able to you know help in the process it is really um it is really concrete stuff that is specific in your case to move in those are the preconditions that translate into uh what i call what i've been calling kiss of death conditions if they don't have them um but you know it's very uh practical so in one sense that's readiness. Um, but then there's the more abstract idea of, okay, what is their degree of commitment? Do they have a functioning team? You know, how do they form a team? Who's going to be the champion? Um, you know, maybe that's a ne next level of abstraction. And then we have kind of higher levels of abstraction, like measuring safety climate or safety culture. You know, and if they have really low scores on safety culture, even though it's not implementation readiness specifically, but there are certainly a lot of overlapping concepts in terms of being able to implement change, being able to learn from mistakes and et cetera. Um, you know, that's another layer of, of readiness. And we have all of that within implementation research as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, I would, I would echo, I really like the idea of the sort of the concrete behavioral indicators of readiness uh, that Laura's mentioning. I know uh, uh, the, we've done some systematic reviews of readiness measures and, and haven't shown great predictive validity for many of the measures that are out there uh, so far. So that makes me sort of um, lean towards those more um, uh, behavioral indicators of readiness. And so I think that's a great, great suggestion. The other thing I find, since you also brought that up, um, you know, Byron, the way that you were talking about that, um, our experience in assessing readiness that, you know, we often want to assess it at two different time points and um, that uh, at least in one of our studies, the response rate went way down in the second round of measurement. And I think part of that, I mean, it was, it was due to a lot of different factors, but part of that I think is that they couldn't really relate to the questions we're asking because they're so high level and abstract. And I know that if that instrument, I'm pro maybe I'm projecting myself onto our poor respondents that I'm not sure I would really know how to respond and I would feel a little irritated with some of the questions that we have in our instruments. Um, because they don't really seem to relate to my world or to what I'm about to, you know, uh, launch on. So, you know, practical measures of readiness and, you know, your, your experience, I think, with the safety culture, um, because there are, you know, those are abstract concepts. And yet I think they're concepts that, at least with some of the items, some of the domains in there are very relatable. 
And then you also have the, you know, much more concrete, like, do you have the FTE in place? Mm -hmm. I think um, we, we've been looking at the readiness tools and sort of the different levels or the different um, aspects that they assess. And, and we have, a, I think, a pretty good sense of almost like a checklist or our own tool that we could create on, on the pieces that you need for move in, like, do you have the FTE? Can you do the training? Are you going to be at, like we under, I think we have our heads wrapped pretty well around that, um, and also this sort of general like, do you have leadership support? You know, do you have buy-in? Do you have that burning platform? Like those change um, readiness for change kinds of pieces. What I think kind of surprised us was that on the one hand, what we think is what makes movement so effective is this um, ownership within the unit um, that that we're we're giving you this framework, and it, and it does have a lot of detail in our toolkit on, on all the pieces of move-in and what you need to do and how you build those whiteboards or these cultural things that Barb's talking about. But I think that what we found was that readiness to sort of own that at a unit level, at least within nursing, is where we kind of missed it. They, they were ready, they were on board, they bought in, they wanted to do it, but how to do it and how to, ha to have that autonomy, I think someone put in, or empowerment, someone put in the comments, um, that was out of the norm, which I think is why it worked because it had that, you know, but it required us to coach them through like, yes, you get to say this piece or you get to co-design or what worked on this other unit. Guess what? We, we intentionally are making space for you to tailor it for this unit, which, um, yes, that happens, but I think that being upfront and, and that participatory process we thought we could just give them the toolkit and say, guess what? You Here's the sections that are prescribed and here's where you get to adapt. And then they would do it. And I think that what we found was that that readiness that at the at the unit level of ownership, um, at least in, in the hospitals that we've worked with so far and within nursing um, was not there. And so that I don't know how you assess that or do we just start to presume that you know what this is going to need still coaching but it, it's coaching for that it's coaching for um anyway so what what is the coaching is also a question you know where do they need it and where can they run by themselves mm -hmm. i'm wondering if we uh could turn to um mentee and and see we have time for one more oh yes. yeah sorry can you hear sorry. me <laughs> <laughs> yes Great. Okay. Um, so to kind of switch topics a little bit, um, we do have a question about um, your SEEPS model, um, because I think this is the first time we're hearing it over the past few days. And so um, can you speak to, if you know, um, both how the SEEPS, what the SEEPS model provides that the C4 model does not, and also how did SEEPS help you understand both context and how you chose your implementation strategies? Oh gosh, that's a great question. And I, I'm looking at the time, so I'm gonna try. Um, so I'll just put this out there. There's a SEEPS model. There are also two more. There's a SEEPS 2.0, a SEEPS 3.0. There's lots of literature on the SEEPS model. Um, so um, Google, Google Scholar for SEEPS, or maybe we can get it on the reference list um, for people to read all about the SEEPS model. I, I have asked myself the question about C for to SEEP and I don't know if Laura wants to, uh, or other Byron want to weigh in, but um, I, I think, again, it, it's somewhat language. To me, I think the SEEPS is collapsed um, much further, or um, it's getting at a lot of the same concepts, um, but, you know, they're laid out maybe a little bit differently, um, and it, it comes from a different discipline, so um, same ideas, but a different perspective. So um, building off that, let's see, C for to SEEPS, Great question. I, I don't have a great answer. Someone else might chime in after I stop talking. And then how we used it. Um, SEEPS is very commonly used as sort of a framework when you're looking at a, a, a quality issue or something that's not going well in healthcare or just a healthcare system. And you want to make sure that you're attending to all pieces. So if you're saying, we, we want these outcomes and there are processes to get there, let's look at the structure. It really helps you make sure, have I looked at technology and tools? Have I looked at tasks? And what are the barriers and facilitators across all these things? Because they, they are linked and often we zoom in on one and we sort of neglect the rest. Um, so it's a really nice framework for helping you to sort of make sure that you're attending to an entire system and then really mapping um, things that you're seeing in terms of barriers or facilitators onto a structure. 
it has not been as commonly used, I believe, and, and others may weigh in, to then immediately go into like a, uh, this type of design. It, it, um, it gives you a good sense of barriers and facilitators. It doesn't necessarily prescribe how to fix them. Um, and so that's where you may need to either use other frameworks or in some cases, it may be obvious, this is the barrier, this technology is flawed, you need to fix that technology. Um, but, and so I'm not totally answering the question, but I'm also looking at the time and wanna give someone else to see if they can help me out. I think similarly, um, when I look at the CEPR model, again, where are the problems? That's why we had to bring social cognitive theory into it. We knew what we needed to address. We didn't know how, we also needed something to help us think about how to change behaviors. And so that's why we blended both of those together because we felt we were limited by just only using one model. Well, um, Great, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, this has been fantastic. And um, we're now gonna have a lunch break um, for 30 minutes. And one thing I'd like you to know is that we will have an evaluation and on that, we ask what topics you would like to hear about next year. We do a lot of work to put on a short course that will um, meet needs of attendees. So if you'd like to hear more about SEEPS next year, vote for it. <laughs> There's a many other things, implementation mapping, just uh, please let us know what you'd like to hear about. And we hope you will be interested in attending next year. So we will start promptly at 1245 using the same Zoom link from the morning and continue to put in questions in Menti. I would like to tell you in the afternoon, we will call up your questions, vote on the ones that um, are most relevant that you'd most like to have for discussion and tee those up in the afternoon. So thanks. <laughs>